Open your Bibles to Luke. No, let's just go to Mark. Luke doesn't have the stories. Open your Bibles to Mark chapter 14. Starting in verse 3. And being in Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at meat, there came a woman, woman having an alabaster box, a voidment, a spike nerd, very precious, and she broke the box and poured it on his head. And there were some that had indignation within themselves. Usually, Judas gets the total blame, even though he had the most indignation. That I don't doubt, and you can verify that in other gospel records. But there's more than just Judas that was aggravated at what was happening. And there were some that had indignation with themselves and said, Why was this waste of the ointment made? For it might have been sold for more than 300 pence and have been given to the poor. And they murmured, they again, not just Judas, murmured against her. And Jesus said, let her alone. Why trouble ye her? She hath wrought a good work on me. For ye have the poor with you always. And whensoever ye will, ye may do them good. But me ye have not always. She hath done what she could. She has come aforehand to anoint my body to the bearing. Verily I say unto you, Wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the, the whole world, this also that she has done shall be spoken of for a memorial of her. Now, you'll see this story in other gospel records. In Matthew chapter 26 and in John chapter 12. And they fill in the little but the rest of the story, that's not included in this particular version, Mark's version. This story takes place just before Jesus goes into Jerusalem for the last time. It takes place just before he rides into Jerusalem on a donkey. Here in Mark's record, he doesn't mention the woman's name. But if you go to the Gospel of John, he does. It's Mary of Bethany. The sister of Martha and Lazarus. Lazarus is the fellow that Jesus raised from the dead. The John record says that Martha was busy serving at this gathering, probably more of a celebration. And Lazarus was sitting at Jesus' side. So that makes Jesus the guest of honor. Here comes Mary. I'm kind of combining all the gospel records now and telling the story. Here comes Mary. She enters the room 
with an alabaster box of perfume. If we read the Mark version of the story, it says and identifies this perfume as spikenard. Now, this is just not any ordinary perfume. It was a very expensive fragrance that was imported from India. It carried a considerable amount of value as far as fragrances goes in those days. And if you read in verse 5, it says, For it might have been sold for more than 300 pence. So we are told approximately what the value is. At least 300 pence, possibly more. It was the equivalent of a year's salary back then for a common person. This was this woman's life savings. Some scholars believe that this perfume was part of Mary's dowry. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. All I know, it's probably all that she possessed. She brought her best to Jesus. Now, when you read all the different stories and you read a little bit about Jewish history, it was customary to wash the feet and, a, and their head of a guest that came in your house. But Mary goes beyond that normal custom, customary practice. In the John record, it says that she anointed Jesus' feet and wiped her hair on Jesus' feet. She wiped him with her hair. She then breaks the container and pours the rest of it, all of its contents, on Jesus' head. Now, what happened? Immediately after that was accomplished, after she did what she did, here comes the critics, ready to criticize what she did. Like I said, it says they. So it's just not Judas, but in one gospel record, Judas was the ringleader. He was the one that was most vocal. <laughs> and what happens, by the way? You read verse 10 in Mark 14, and Judas, after this, this so upset Judas this is the straw that broke the camel's back. That And Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went on to the chief priest to betray him unto them. After this alabaster box event is when Judas betrayed Jesus. Well, she's wasting this precious perfume. What a waste. She could have sold it and, and given all the money that she received to the poor. Like that was the first thing they thought of when they saw that alabaster box. Take it from Mary's perspective. What she might have felt for a few seconds or maybe a few minutes before Jesus responds. 
There's so many ways to preach this story. I'm probably going to preach it many different times, coming from different angles. But I've never came from this angle before. Just imagine if you're Mary, before Jesus spoke up, after listening to those fools, those critics. Just think how she must have felt. You ever did something for someone and someone else notices and they start putting it down? Well, times that by a hundred. She poured out everything that she had as an act of worship. And she gets criticized and ridiculed by no other than the disciples of Jesus. Her brother got raised from the dead by Jesus. If they're in the flesh, do you think they stop long enough to realize maybe she's just being so thankful that she wanted to return a nice gesture, do something for Jesus to show how thankful she was. Now, some believe and some don't believe that she knew exactly what was about to happen. She listened to Jesus closely and she knew that his time was coming that he would be murdered, killed. And this is, was her way, as it was also customary to do to prepare for someone's burial, usually after the fact, after they're dead, and she did it prior. Now, we'll never know exactly what was in these people's head, but we do know they had feelings like you and me. Before Jesus, Jesus intervenes, these disciple idiots decides, decide to criticize her. Basically calling her and what she did wasteful. Look at all the poor people that could have benefited from, from it if she just wisely gave that gift to them and not pour it upon Jesus. For a very short, brief of t amount of time, I'm sure her heart was broken. Hearing that kind of criticism from these fools. But thank God, we don't know exactly how long it took, but Jesus steps in and puts a stop to all of their criticism. Every single one. He tells his disciples to leave her alone. Let her alone. Because she has done a good work unto him. He goes on and says, you can help the poor any time. But you're not going to have the opportunity, if you read the story, and not very many opportunities to show their love for him in person. These disciples knew whether they wanted to believe it was going to happen or not, but they knew because they heard that he was going to Jerusalem for a purpose, and that purpose was to be put to death. 
And what really he's communicating, whether they got it or not, that what Mary did, her act of, act of devotion to Jesus will serve as his anointing for his death. Now he goes on in the story and says that wherever this gospel, wherever the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is preached, this act of worship, this act of devotion by Mary would be preached, would be discussed, and would be remembered. This alabaster box of ointment contained something that was extremely precious. But think about it. Yeah, she could have hung on to it. She could have saved it. It could be part of a retirement plan. Whatever excuses normal people make, she could have came up with. But I think, I believe, as long as it stayed in that container, it didn't benefit anyone. Hear me closely. The more tighter the grip you have on your possessions, I guarantee you, it will not benefit anyone, including yourself, because you'll get no eternal rewards for it. And it sure is not going to benefit anyone down here. Now, in John's record, it says that when this ointment, this perfume, was poured out on, upon Jesus, that the fragrance of this perfume filled the house. Jesus called an, it an act of good work, an act of employment, because it involved her doing something with it. And the original Greek actually means a beautiful thing. A beautiful thing. Now, without going off the deep end in a super spiritual sense that most do, God has given each one of us a spiritual gift or gifts. It could be of great faith. It could be teaching. It could be acts of service. Whatever it is, if you keep it to yourself, It does not benefit anyone. The same goes with giving. Now, it's not my responsibility to figure out, you as a disciple, what your gift is. That's for you to decide and work out with Jesus. But whatever it is, use it for the glory of God and the benefit of all those around you, the people that you do know and the people that you don't know. And that's what you do when you give here. You're taking your gift, not only laying up in it, it, it as a treasure in heaven, as Christ commanded, but knowing that it also is going to benefit others.
What good is a gift if you never put it into use? Some of you have the gift of making money. God gave you that gift for a purpose. You know, the beautiful thing, back to that, about this story is when Mary wiped Jesus' feet with her own hair, she walked away smelling like Jesus did. The point is, when we use what we have for Jesus, others can sense that we have been with him also. It shows our love for Jesus. And it shows when you give not only that Jesus loves sinners, but we too have the love that Jesus had for sinners. How's that? Because your gifts will help and advance the mission forward in reaching a lost world with many lost souls that need the rightly divided word of God. I've received alabaster boxes. I'm going to read you one tonight. I have permission to do so in the letter that I received with the alabaster box. I received alabaster boxes from people over the years. There's one lady in the Midwest, upper Midwest area, that sent her life savings of jewelry. I'm not just talking about a few pieces. I never shared this with anyone, but it allowed us to do many different things in this ministry that I really haven't even talked about. This woman's still a part of this ministry, participating monthly, actually weekly, and a very faithful listener Besides, just give her. Since there was a lo very large sum of jewelry given, we took that jewelry, and it took us a while, years in fact, to get the best price we could so we get the most value from that alabaster box gift to advance the rightly divided word of God that's preached in this ministry. Others I kept. Because the value wouldn't be so much as far as materialistic, materialistically values that you would put on something if you resell it on the market. But there, one day if I have a location, will be moralized in what I would call the hall of faith of people that was more concerned of pleasing God and wanted fruit credit to their account. They wanted their offering to be well-pleasing unto God. And as long as I'm alive, those things will never be sold, including the one I'll read to you tonight. You can't put no money value on it. And you'll see the reasons why when I read you the letter that I received.
you read in verse 8, she had done what she could. She couldn't keep the Jewish leaders from falsely accusing Jesus. She couldn't keep the Roman soldiers from crucifying him. She had done what she could. She couldn't keep the crowds from mocking him. But she could show, and she did, her love and devotion by sacrificing the most precious thing that she owned, the most precious thing that she possessed. And for that, Jesus told his disciples to leave her alone and stop criticizing her. I never, and I make this a practice, disregard or devalue anyone's act of service. I just won't do it. Some of you and your egos, your spiritual pride, will stop yourself from giving an alabaster box because you think, well, this doesn't really mean anything to him or the ministry. They won't see the value in it like I do. And maybe they can't even sell it if that's what the intention is, to rightly divide the word of God and send it forth. That's not for you to determine, my friend. Cut off the spiritual pride nonsense. Give with love and devotion like you should give, knowing that it is also a good work and a good employment of that type of act of worship. So what happens? This story is told. Unfortunately, not often enough, I'm just as guilty. The world over, in the gospel record. It's another story that's told also, if you really look at it, in verse 10. Judas wanted to get his hands on the money, if you read the John record. So when Jesus condemns the disciples for criticizing Mary, what does Judas do? He decided to get his money another way. Think about it. And Judas Iscariot, one of his twelve, went unto the chief priest to betray him unto him. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. And he sought how he might conveniently betray him. Basically, Judas went over to these religious phonies, evil phonies, to hand over Jesus for a price. One of the other gospel stories said that the price they paid for Jesus was 30 pieces of silver. 30 pieces of silver. It makes you wonder sometimes, including myself, what is Jesus worth to me? You read the story. To Mary, he was worth everything that she had. 
period. To Judas, he was worth 30 pieces of silver. To some people, if you're lucky, if that church is lucky, he is worth a dollaring, dollar, excuse me, a dollar in the offering plate, maybe once a week. I've been there so many times, I don't need to go there. Remember Romans 12 teachings? We should be living sacrifices. Which means that we need to give ourselves. Some of us, or some of you, are so pleased with yourself because you give 10%. Some of you might even expect a pat in the back for it. Well, you know what I feel about tithing. It's flat line giving. And I'm sorry, unless you could prove me wrong using the New Testament teachings on giving, not the Old Testament that holds you back. There's no tithe in the New Testament. Outside, when Jesus penned the Pharisees concerning what they were tithing. In one incident, and he was talking to the Pharisees that were trying to keep the law, the Old Testament tithing system. You want to know who the New Testament standard is? Is to give all. I'm not asking for all your money or possessions. That's between you and Jesus. I'm not too sure he's asking for everything from you most of the time. He just wants to know what's in your heart. Are you willing to go that far if necessary for him? And I've tuned out a lot of people by now. Because even though you don't practice it, you like that tithing method. Even though you pay more in taxes, you don't have a problem paying God less. Well, the average is what? I forgot what. Somewhere between 3 and 7% is the last thing I read. I think it's lower than that. You pay, pay more in sales taxes for the stuff you buy here in California. I think it's at 9.75%. And I'm not just talking about money, by the way, friends. I'm talking about you. How much of yourself do you truly give to the Lord? I can't answer that for you. I can answer it for myself, but I can't answer it for you. How much of yourself do you give to the Lord? Most people, the Lord's an aftermath. After everything is done for the day, after everything else is paid for. After everybody else has exhausted your time. After everything and everybody exhausted your energy. Then maybe if you have time and enough energy, you'll stop it. maybe to communicate with God that day. Heck. I'm not going to 
going to say what I wanted to say. How much what you have to bring glory and honor to him are you keeping all to yourself? Well, this message hurts. It's meant to hurt. Because the standard hasn't been reduced, even though the church world has reduced it to a commitment that only you'll keep if it entertains you or somehow appeases your flesh in some way. A lot of you need to stop and say, what can I do? What can I do? And you need to start somewhere if you haven't. My suggestion is that don't pro prolong that. First step. But maybe if Jesus is not coming back sooner than later, maybe generations from now, maybe decades, some will be talking about your act of devotion. Using you as an example of someone that took the word of God and applied it in their life and meant business. Just like we're talking about Mary today. We're at 60% of the budget. In the flesh, my flesh tells me that chances are we're not going to make it. That's what I was fighting all afternoon, all day for the last two days, especially up to the point where I was trying to decide what I'm going to preach tonight. And I was going to continue in jo on Joseph. Then I received something in the mail. That whether we received 100% of the budget or not, it really didn't matter after I read this and what I received. It really encouraged me. Because it tells me, not to mention how well-pleasing it is to the Lord, and you'll know why in a minute. But as far as I'm concerned, it tells me there's some out there that do get it. that are willing to be placed in the same position as Mary was in verse 8. She had done what she could. You need to write down in the margin of your Bible, I have done what I could. And really repeat it over and over in your mind. Read it out loud. Do whatever it takes to answer that question truthfully. Have I done what I can do? Or am I holding back? I, can you say I have done what I could? I don't care if I get another penny. Financially, we'll make it. God has given me the ability to make money. And if I have to find a way to do it to cover the rest of this month's budget, I will. But as far as I'm concerned, by what I received today, not only we achieved the budget, but we went over the budget in my mindset because it only takes one. And there's a lot, of, I don't want to take anything away from all the sacrifice that's been given by people that have given this month. You're in the same camp. As far as I'm concerned, with the person that gave this alabaster box, which I'm about, read, about ready to read to you. But this came in at a perfect time. Received it. I received it early this afternoon. And it couldn't have been at a better time to encourage, encourage me. 
I believe they encourage you, the faithful, that the word of God is making an impact. And this is someone that was also in a ministry where I was for 30 years that found me somehow. I'm not too sure the story, how that happened, but this is what I received. This was dated 718. I finally received it today. This letter is my explanation for sending this alabaster box. I love the Lord for sending great teachers to me like Joe Kortz, Gene Scott, and my dad. And he gave me the name of his dad. But I am a very slow learner. You could characterize me and my walk with God as repeatedly hard-headed. That, of course, permeated my coaching slash teaching career. All of my professional career, I have an, had an outstanding reputation as a hard worker, knowledgeable, great motivator, especially in the sports of football and track and field. People called, on, called me on the phone asking me to come and resurrect their programs because my reputation is that I'm a fixer. But I was unfulfilled and never could quite get to that apex. My teams and athletes would be great. We'd be on a doorstep of achieving greatness and something would happen to cause us to fall short. This went on for 30 years. I knew something was wrong. What was wrong was me. I knew the 2014 football season at the high school, which I'll keep anonymous for now, was likely going to be my last. Our family dynamic was changing with becoming a full-time parent to our granddaughter. I could feel Jesus Christ in my soul. That August, his granddaughter and I were chasing around in the backyard and we were listening to music. The lyrics kept hammering in my head, bring it on, don't wait until tomorrow. And I'm thinking, that's right. That's the way we need to approach the upcoming season. We are going to live every day in spirit and enjoy every practice, every meeting, and every moment. We are not going to worry about game night. Game night will get here when it does. We're going to embrace excellence every day and enjoy each other. So then my very next thought was of the old L.A. Rams coach from the early 70s named George Allen. His mantra was, the future is now. Many of the old L.A. people in your audience will remember the great George Allen. So I was thinking about these two phrases, bring it on and the future is now. An acronym was born, BIOFIN, B-I-O-F-I-N, which stands for bring it on, future is now. But that was just the beginning. I sat down and stared at BIOFIN and then boom, another more in-depth acronym appeared. B-I-O-F-I-N, by, of, in, in. I kept thinking about faith, life, trust, trusting God, trusting our coaches, trusting our teammates. No matter what happens, trust that we are all doing everything we can to be what God intended us to be. How were we going to be successful? By faith, of faith, in faith. So a double acronym was now born. We went to preseason camp and I and our coaching staff hammer our philosophy home day in a uh, hammered our philosophy home day in and day out. Every day was about biofin. The outlook started with me. I had to get out of my way and let God guide the ship. I prayed over everything from weight room workouts to practice schedules to team meals to game plans. Every time I addressed a team, individual players or coaches, I prayed. I completely let go and moved into the so be it faith because I had finally realized that whether we hold a state championship trophy or not, Jesus was enough and I was at peace. <coughs> we didn't change a thing with our scheme, schedule, or other things on the operational end. <coughs> week in and week out, we annihilated every Oregon opponent. Now you know the state. We had to go to another state to find a top-rated 
team who could beat us. There were still doubts as we entered the playoffs. Aside from wrestling, their high school had never won anything, especially football. We get to the 2014 state championship game and there are still very few believers. Our opponent, Silverton, had been the number one team in the state all year. The day before the game, a major publication stated it was inevitable that Silverton would easily defeat us. Well, you know what happened. We slaughtered them. For all intents and purposes, the game was over by the end of the third quarter. I never had a team play with such toughness, awareness, precision, and unselfishness. The whole state was in shock except the players and the coaches. We knew it when we had, we knew it, we had Biofin. All that came from teaching that I received from you, Doc, and my dad. I learned that blessings will flow through me if I'll trust him, move, I'll tr- if I trust, if I'll trust him, move into the so be it faith. I learned how beautiful and joyful it is to be useful for his purpose, purposes, or to be used for his purposes. I know God doesn't pay much attention to outcome of silly sporting contests, but he will use our ministries, families, and our professions to teach us to follow him. Ruha. So my alabaster box is this ring, or Oregon State Championship ring. It isn't much, but I think it's beautiful. We t- picked the purple amethyst gem because it is the color of royalty, parentheses Jesus, and one of our school colors. It has the score, our names, and one other thing. The players steadfastly insisted that their mantra, belief system, their faith be inscribed on the ring biofin. With great joy in my heart, I part with this ring and give the glory to God and love to his under shepherd, Joe Quartz. And not to be overlooked, my beautiful and faithful wife. Thank you, Lord, for not giving up on me. You have my permission to share this if you find it needful. If not, I just wanted you to know. Also enclosed, you will find a highlight film, which I had not time to look at it yet, but I plan to. I didn't pick the music, the players did, ha ha. My voice is on the film, some, and I appear briefly at the end, doused in frigid water giving interviews to those brilliant members of the media. Yes, that's me. In Jesus' name, gives me his name. Disciple of Jesus Christ by the way of teaching faith ministries. You'll never know how timely this letter in this alabaster box will be for me and this ministry for the years to come. Like I said, I didn't didn't care if we received another dime this month. This brought so much joy and encouragement to my heart because you really couldn't place a value on it if I tried. So far, as far as I'm concerned, not only we reached budget, not only did we reach budget, but we went over and beyond. This is the ring. Camera's not really doing it justice. It has the year 2014, Oregon State champions. The score of the game was 34 to 12. The name of the person, which I'll cover up for now, and Biofin. You know what Biofin was? I like the second acronym better. By faith, of faith, in faith. But by, uh, or by of him, B-I-O-F-I-N. By, of, and in. By faith, of faith, in faith. This is never to be sold. That's my instructions. This will be memorialized forever 
in this ministry's Hall of Faith. I pray the day we have a location, a permanent location where it can be displayed, you'll still get the eternal rewards because it's my decision to display it. So others can read it, be encouraged by it, have their faith built by it, because they saw another fellow hero of faith grab on the God's word and show the Lord that it's more important to give than to receive in this case. They received the state championship, but he gave something much more important that was well-pleasing to the Lord. That will be accumulating everlasting, eternal rewards long after this game was played. This is the kind of people I'm looking for. This is the kind of people that mean what they say and they are committed to being faithful participants for the glory of God. Not just concerned about their own well-being. And you do have to take care of. And I'm no fool. I know you need money to pay bills. But there's plenty of, out you, you, of you out there that are not going to give an alabaster box that can't support. There's just too many of you that keep on listening, keep on reading, keep on absorbing everything you can from this ministry and refuse to participate. What makes you think that Christ is not recording your actions? There is a judgment seat of Christ coming. That's where the rewards are going to be handed out. Our salvation will not be in question. But your life and how you responded to his call as a disciple of Jesus Christ will be. Yes, you'll make it in. But how well pleasing you'll be to him as a true, obedient disciple of Jesus Christ. It's time for you to take this serious, folks. This is no joke. And I guarantee you, every time you get involved, whether it's giving, participating, doing something for this ministry, there'll be a lot of people like those disciples saying, what a waste of time. Some of them will be your own family members, loved ones, mother, fathers, brothers, sisters, wives, husbands saying, what a waste of time. Your time can be put, put to better use than what you're doing over there. Oh, really? Who died and made them God? How are they determining that? It's not a waste of time. I'll repeat what Jesus said. Leave us alone. Let us do all that we can do. I want everyone listening to me tonight that is serious about being an active participant in the work of God to ask themselves, have I done all that I can do? Have I done all that I can do? Next step's yours. 
to this alabaster box. I mean, to the person that gave this alabaster box, you'll never know how much it means to me and how much it will mean to others in the future. What you are willing to do for the glory of God. And there's more like you that's done the same. I thank God and pray for you daily that your trust and commitment in Jesus remains strong and you keep marching down here as an obedient disciple of Jesus Christ. And even though the naysayers and the criticizers will come, I have... Someone that asked me not too long ago, well, it was about a year ago. I don't, I don't know what to do with myself throughout the day. I'm bored. I guarantee you, mark my words, start doing something that concerns this ministry. Whether it's giving, whether it's giving your time, whatever. I guarantee you'll get more distractions and your life become less boring almost overnight to distract you from your focus on giving back. Not giving back, but giving your time, your efforts, your money unto the Lord. Distractions will come from every different angle. From people that you love, and for people you don't like that very much, it will come. See how bored you are then. All of a sudden, everybody's your new best friend or every, you're the favorite relative. They want to be with you. They want to use you. They want to do every, whatever they want to do with you. So it takes more time away from what you set off to commit to do for the Lord. It just goes with the turf, my friend. You want this, you want to, you want Satan's and his minions' attention? Get saved. You want further intensity of his, of his efforts to distract you and throw you off course? Participate. I guarantee you, it's never failed that I, what I have seen for that to come to pass. Nothing angers the evil minions more than seeing someone saved, number one, connected to the vine, but participating to make other connections. And by making me, go make disciples. In the capacity that you are able to do it in. This summer, we've seen plenty of that. Well, it's not too late to turn it around. Some of you have nothing left to give. Maybe you have an alabaster box that either could be sold I'm the one who will determine that or place in the Hall of Faith, Teaching Faith Ministries Hall of Faith Memorial. When I'm long gone, will still be memorialized for future generations if that has happened to be so, which I don't think so, but we'll see. To look back and say, this true was a father of God who trust in Jesus to get him through this life in preparation for the next. Next step is yours. Give something, whether it's an offering 
or an alabaster box. Give something so we can rub it into minions' faces that want to see this ministry destroyed. When I say minions, I'm talking about evil, unseen spiritual enemies that's doing everything they can to stop the participation in this ministry so it hopefully can die. It tried to attack my body, and for three and a half years, I fought it off. Now I sense the attack is intensifying on you. That's the only conclusion I could come to watching the drop in participation. What other conclusion do you have? And don't give me some earthly common sense solution that makes sense to you. We're fighting a spiritual warfare, my friend, that involves the unseen, that uses the seen as pawns in their battle to keep the word of God rightly divided. Next step is yours. I have said enough. Play a song.